which is equivalent to raising a hand to attract the attention of the teacher. The teacher, sitting at the remote studio, can accept the query by clicking on the computer screen. Immediately, the student will appear on the screen and will have the question answered by the instructor. Hi, uh, good evening all of you. Uh, so, let us uh, start with our uh, last uh, session today. Uh, okay, now, we have a question. Uh, we have a couple of questions like what about rest of the case studies and so on and so forth. Uh, again, like uh, the idea was that if, if you really look at it, we have done a fairly intensive uh, thing or the course and we have covered most of the ground that I wanted to uh, cover in this course. Uh, and of course, on rest of the case studies and things, I'll actually give you some uh, brief levels of ideas today uh, that would actually take us to the next level and so on and so forth. Uh, so we will uh, try to cover close the session today and just try to close the whole program with sets of learnings and everything and what we have learned during the course and uh, such things. So th that is what we will actually do today. And uh, before I actually move ahead, I think we have to start with the blue ocean uh, case and. Uh, uh, let me let me try to understand like, uh, how many of who would like to actually talk about uh, blue ocean case here. Uh, would you like to enter that industry? And if you want to enter that industry, how would you actually enter and so on and so forth? A any ideas from any one of you? If any one of you could actually raise your hands, uh, that would actually help. Is Okay, Pratabhi Raman, I will do a cold call here today. So, let us see what Pratabhi Raman has to say about this. Hello. Yes, Pratabhi Raman. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, before, before getting into the actual blue ocean, uh, the strategy per se, uh, I hope I am loud, loud and clear, clear, loud, audible. Okay, great. I had just done some Googling and uh, part of the Googling exercise I thought I could just share with uh, all of us out here. Uh, it, it is very interesting, it is a very interesting case. I think uh, the author had to uh, try and make out a strategy and then we would follow it up. But nevertheless, uh, this would just add up to the entire um, game plan. Uh, the Google exercise started with a simple understanding as to um, how the Sula vineyards in India operate today, uh, where did they start off from, uh, with a very humble beginning of uh, uh, probably about 1996 when there is a gentleman by name Rajiv uh, Samant uh, who moved in from the US uh, into the Indian subcontinent who felt that uh, there was a need of uh, driving a business for his own self and he planted up uh, a 30 acre uh, farmland which, which he owned and uh, he tried to grow table grapes at the, that hour. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, please. I'm, I'm able to hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he, he started off trying to talk something about the mangrove growth and uh, which was not very really profitable, and hence he thought that let me try an opportunity to take an opportunity louder. of planting about just about five acres of land into the uh, table grapes. That is how, uh, with taking uh, the help of one of the uh, pioneers, the wine expert. One, uh, one by name uh, Damsky, Kerry Damsky of uh, the California wine expert, he is the California wine, wine expert. He took his help, probably landed up in the country and grew up the entire 30 acre uh, into a uh, table uh, grid. And that is how the two varieties per se, uh, the Chilean blend and the Sauvignon blend, these are the two varieties of the grapes which are, uh, which are the white grape kind of a variety which came into the uh, 
growing part which we grew them and uh, uh, by the first by by somewhere by the 2000 uh, uh, year uh, Sula actually saw first of its crush out there and today with about 3 million uh, liters of wine being produced I think which constitutes close to about 75 percent of the wine today in the country from a modest uh, 30 acre I guess we have moved up close to around 1800 uh, acres plus and uh, posted a pack of about 1 million dollars with a total turnover or revenues of about 12 million dollars so that is something, it is a flashback which uh, which I could get out of. Something very interesting happened uh, in the consumption patterns which I could uh, really get out of some more googling. Uh, India's per capita wine consumption is a pathetic uh, 10 <laughs> ml milliliters. And, uh, 10 milliliters? And China, like about 10 milliliters. Okay. And uh, China's uh, per capita consumption is about 400 milliliters. Vis-a-vis -vis the US per capita consumption of about 2.5 gallons, which is close to about 9.45 liters. So there's a huge uh, gap, and probably there is an extreme. Let me put the extreme. Both India is a developing country; it has got its own uh, uh, you know, challenges there. Where how could a domestic market be developed? Per se, uh, an overseas market like the US, which is so very attractive, very fierce, uh, which, which is not. Uh, this statistics again show that it is not mature. There is still a lot of um, growth and uh, very interesting thing uh, which is found in the US market is it is the only market per se in the, in the entire world today which is growing at, uh, uh, no, at about 5 dollars per bottle every year. I think that is the type of revenue one could uh, no, expect uh, additional revenue to be generated. That means there is a uh, tremendous growth, uh, growth aspect there and uh, so that is how the uh, thing came up. Some more googling, uh, no, uh, uh, interestingly, we saw that uh, um, France, Italy, and uh, France, Italy, and Spain are the uh, three countries uh, on the wine industry, uh, starting with France, Italy, Spain, and US is the number four. But yes, by the 2012, probably exactly about four years down the line or two, three years down the line, I guess it, US would uh, make up to world's largest uh, uh, market. It is currently expected at about 152 billion dollars. So that is the type of market vis-a-vis -vis India, 60 million dollars. So that is the type of two extreme market uh, market numbers. Uh, a little more insight. Uh, little more insight shows that the growth is to be propelled by the women folk out there and the younger generation. So there is some sort of a fun thing. There is some sort of uh, excitement there. And uh, somebody has not seen the women folk uh, uh, being tapped earlier in the market for reading from them. And uh, women folk actually constitute close to about 52 to 54 percent of the US uh, population, with about 57 percent of the wine being purchased by them. And they're they're not uh, too very tech savvy of things alike. What what really appeals to be very very simple things in life, uh, probably the quality of wine. So they don't really care about the ratings which many of the wine industry would give to any other uh, no, uh, to the uh, to a various uh, wines. So they look at quality of wine. Per se, they look at the shape of the bottle, it needs to be attractive, and uh, for reasons, uh, uh, label design, very interesting label design. The fourth point, which also came up in the entire uh, gamut, was the, the industry is not shrinking, and the wine imports have actually uh, gone up from uh, the last seven years in the US, which is like from 1998 to 2005, it has moved up from 40 million cases to about 51 million cases. So that means there is a reason why an import, uh, uh, import kind of a wine should do well. So there is a case where again Sula could enter, so there is something interesting. Interestingly what is also found is California which is half of the uh, wine industry in the US has seen uh, less interest in the extensive wines. So that means that there is a wine which is currently in the US which is at very high uh, Rate. It is not a budget. Uh, uh, it's not a budget wine. That means uh, some more signals for somebody to uh, use that as an option of the um, blue ocean. So that is something which a uh, founding came up. Now coming back to the um, uh, case in terms of uh, yes, yes, the blue ocean. I think there are certain parameters which were uh, which were actually which were actually seen, and some of the uh, uh, parameters which are studied were, hello? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Devakar. 
Yeah, yeah. Some of the parameters which have actually fed the studies were the quality of aging, uh, of the wine, the, the pricing, the marketing efforts, the, uh, the wine complexity, and uh, something in terms of wine ranges, in terms of fun and adventure, the ease of selection of the wine, uh, probably the shape of the bottle, probably the, the um, analogical uh, uh, terms. Uh, these are some of the things where the wine industry prevails and somebody would like to get into the industry per se will have to map out the how well they um, uh, are pegged against uh, the competition. So saying that I think one has to just score uh, them against the factors of competition which again uh, which is uh, derived from the uh, strategic angle. The, the, the graph so, shows it all. So these are about 8, 9, 10, 12 parameters which to be pegged against uh, the competition 1, 2, 3 and taken forward. So this is my understanding of uh, the entire uh, exercise and uh, there is definitely a presentation which I have. Unfortunately, this system doesn't support it. I will have to put it for the um, uh, for people to see. Well, why don't you just share this uh, presentation on the... Uh, but why don't you just share this presentation on the email so at least we are able to see what you have done. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just mail it up. I'll mail it up, not an issue. Uh, but uh, the system doesn't support, that's an issue. I'll try and see if I can download it. Otherwise, I think uh, what has happened is, uh, uh, I think both Vichu and Murli Sundar have, I think, uh, uh, got a similar set of uh, interesting insights. In fact, uh, surprisingly, we have all shared at the 11th hour post doing our own individual efforts. I think they too also have got some really, very interesting insights. I think we should ask Murli Sundar and Vishu to come over. Sure. I think should, uh, <laughs> Bo both of them are not there for the session here. In fact, Murli is there, so we'll ask. No, uh, they are there. No, Vishu is there. Oh, Vishu yes, I can see them now. Sundar yes. Also there. Sure. So yeah, let, let yeah, me just yeah. ask them to give their views here. But very, very interesting. A very interesting, Devakar. Very interesting. Yeah. I, I really like the analysis and the data that you're actually giving through. So let, let's let's move ahead and let's talk to Devakar and see what Devakar has to say on this. Uh, yes, Devakar. Hello. Yeah, Devakar. Yeah, I was saying that I guess uh, the result uh, generated by googling uh, done by Pratapi Raman and me are quite similar. I will not get into all those details which he has already mentioned. A few takes, uh, let, let me confess one thing, uh, as far as the uh, uh, strategy canvas uh, was concerned, uh, I am not very game in there, so I haven't uh, done anything on that. I have captured few points which uh, makes my case that uh, we should get into the market. Uh, there are few trends which are available. Uh, US being the largest market, they are talking about uh, a retail value of a 30 billion dollar market. 90% of that comes from the table wine. Uh, that is a segment where in Sula as well as present. Uh, there, there is a trend uh, uh, which says that uh, uh, prima facie there are three categories of the wines available. The red one, wine one and one segment they call as blush. Uh, in in last uh, five odd years, uh, uh, blush as a segment has degrown from 34% to 15%. And the same has been captured by the red which was at 25% kind of share and uh, which has grown to 43%. Mm -hmm. The segment of white has remained somehow constant at a 41-42 percent. Uh, wine import uh, uh, coming into US as a market uh, has been primarily from five countries, as I mentioned. 87 percent of the wine which is being imported into the US as a market, and uh, it's being con uh, contributed by the European countries. So, France uh, contributes a 31 percent, Italy gets a 28 percent share. Australia has a presence of 17 odd percent, then Spain and Chile are there. Uh, another study says that uh, the European vineyards, there is a, a degrowth as far as the production is concerned. So there is an opportunity available for anybody else who wants to pitch into this uh, uh, market, the imported wine market for the US as a market. Uh, 
the imports to sell in the US market for the wine transaction has grown to almost 25 percent. Mm. There are reports, the one which uh, Prabhavi Raman was mentioning for the 2012. So it says that there will be a CAGR of 7.7 uh, percent uh, for next couple of years available as well. So the market will be growing, there won't be stagnation. Uh, prime of AC, the imports which are coming in into this market is there into the bottom segment. So they, are, they have uh, segmented the market on the price fronts. They are talking about less than $7, $7 to $11, $11 plus and, they, and uh, there is another premium segment of $20 uh, uh, kind of price. Uh, there is some contradiction in my finding as Patavi Raman was saying that uh, uh, California wines which are the largest producer of uh, wine as a section, uh, they contribute to the uh, majority of the consumption, but even in this $20 segment, the presence of Californian wine is high. So they have got a strong hold there as well. If if Sula wants to get into get an entry into this market as of now, my proposition will be we, we start as a OEM supplier to this market, wherein there is a decent requirement of uh, imported wines, because in that uh, market creating brand for Sula, investing that much initial years, uh, might not uh, bear the fruit. It might become a, a longer session period as well. So I'm not very sure whether I will be able to put up that brand immediately or not. If I'm able to uh, satisfy the taste buds of uh, that section mm. by even by supplying as a OEM to that market, I know that I have uh, captured a market. I know there is a justifiable demand available in the market. Down the line, I can always pitch my claim that since anyway for last four years or five years I was supplying into this market and you were consuming Sula wines by these brand names. Now here I come uh, with my own brand and uh, I establish into that segment. Mm -hmm. uh, Murli has uh, shared a PPT. I am not very good at that. Uh, I have forwarded the mail to you as well. So probably Murli might uh, want to comment upon the uh, reduction and evolution strategy. Sure, I, I sure. leave yeah. it from you. But, uh, but, but great, Dwakar. So then let's see what Murli has to say here and then uh, we'll move ahead. Yes, Murli. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Murli, can you unmute the mic? Hello. Yes, Murli. Yeah, it's done. It's done. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Hi. Hi. So I think all of us are interested in pulling my leg. <laughs> okay, now at least they have one uh, scapegoat here. They'll let them go through this one. <laughs> Okay, fine. Uh, see, I, I did go through uh, some of these data shared by uh, uh, Murli and Divakar, um, but I actually didn't look, get too much into data at this point of time, uh, because you know, I was just looking at it from the factors that influence this business and the factors that can play a role in changing ground rules of the, uh, you know, the strategy, what a new entrant could do in uh, uh, say, for instance, in U.S. Uh, see, I don't know how uh, I understood this as Sulu wanting to enter into the U.S. market. So, how would they, you know, kind of look at the canvas per se? Uh, I looked at uh, from a slightly a different perspective. Uh, see, uh, the Indian um, market is small, but it's evolving. But I think largely they're going to anyway depend upon. Um, uh, the exports market for time to come. Mm -hmm. But then what's interesting uh, from our point of view is uh, since we eat a lot of spicy food, uh, there seem to be some kind of sweetness which is expected as part of wine drinking or table wines. Uh, in the in the US, the wine today is a very complicated taste. Uh, probably it is considered to be as uh, you know somebody who is evolved in drinking liquor and things like that would be the one who would appreciate the taste of wine. So then it's actually narrowing down and wine becomes a very exclusive kind of people's, uh, you know, kind of habit or a hobby to drink wine. Uh -huh. So that's the prima facie from where I took this out and I looked at it from uh, the other 
two critical parameters. One is aging of wine, which is anyway critical for this business. The other thing is uh, the heritage, which this brings into. Then I looked at some interesting things like how wine uh, can excite the younger generation. Uh, so I looked at uh, since it's going from India, uh, what if it has to bring in a sexual connotation? Like, uh, you know, a sex appeal with a Kama Sutra kind of uh, thing uh, wrapped around it. Because see, people know India for its heritage in terms of uh, the Mohal and the Hindu architecture. And all the Hindu architecture, the temples, the Ajanta, Ellora caves, all of them actually talk about the, uh, you know, explicitly talk about the Kama Sutra depictions. So, and grapes is also linked quite with sexual eroticism. So I thought maybe that's one of the platforms in which it can actually pull from an uh, exclusive to an expansive kind of a consumer group, uh -huh. which could actually bring in more more people into the uh, wine drinking habit because it's the growth is happening. There are more players, but uh, the per capita consumption has to go up, which is also one of the veterans in the category. How would it help? How would this uh, connotation help? Come into it. See, it is, the way how you package things, how you communicate it, see, then basically, currently it's, it's basically for a select group of people, you know, who like the taste, you know, who like complicated taste, I don't know whether they even understand whether that it tastes like something, you know, that's where the wine thing is all about, so it's a few kind of a people, you want to look at uh, a common man to get into it, a normal beer drinker to get into it, or a normal uh, coffee drinker to, you know, kind of have wine as part of uh, any drinking habit, then you need to kind of make it a little more uh, out of these people and then move on. But then anybody who knows and wants to drink wine, they really talk about the heritage with what it comes and uh, how old is the wine. Uh, so uh, I looked at some technology wherein you can actually, uh, you know, get the aging done because I think it's a process of fermentation. So, if there is a technology which can actually take the fresh grapes and actually process it uh, as a 10-year-old wine or a 20-year-old wine, then why actually go through this entire process of making it, um, you know, keeping it for 10 years, physically get it fermented and then process it into a wine. So, I looked at one of technology. From a marketing point of view, I looked at something which is easily, which, is, uh, which will catch like fire because that's why sex was looked at. So I, put in fun and think plus also from a uh, value for money where the taste and the money connotation to more in terms of uh, you know I drink wine you know uh, I'm an extrovert I'm you know a kind of a guy you know with uh, an, uh, you know uh, an appeal to the masses so I'm just moving that continuum from one end to the other end so that's really what I looked at I did not look at pricing it lower and things like that the pricing probably will have to be in between, but the difference that we make is only here, uh, where in terms of how it is to be uh, made to appeal to the consumer groups. So that's really how I looked at, plus I looked at flavors, uh -huh. uh, where coffee, uh, the, where the uh, grape reminds the main thing, but a tinge of uh, a base uh, flavor of a coffee or a, a cheese or a, uh, a, you know, a, a rum, you know, the, that kind of a thing to kind of bring that exoticism into the whole product offering. Uh, very interesting. So you've actually read the complete book and you've tried to use the com whole huge set of ideas in terms of <laughs> what can actually be done. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> very yeah, I did go through it. <laughs> okay. Uh, very interesting uh, set of things here. Uh, but again, uh, I think all three of you have actually made some very interesting points in terms of like what can be done. Uh, I think when you talk about say Sula, Sula trying to do something to do with say Kama Sutra or whatever. Uh, very interesting points, uh, but uh, I really don't know how we could actually do it. Uh, if you are really talking about say Menka and Vishwamitra and all those kind of things, uh, the age old uh, stories of whatever, uh, do you think people in the West would actually know about it? And uh, how, how many people would really appreciate within the country and so on and so forth? But anyways. If you want to do this whole thing in India, if you want to actually increase the consumption of wine in India, uh, how would you do that? What would be the steps that you would take, Murli? 
this is say US. Now we are really talking about US right now. But if I want to sell wine in India, how would you do it? Uh, because if you really look at one of the figures that was shared, in India the per capita mm -hmm. consumption is 10 ml. It's 10 ml, yeah. So how would you actually do this? Yeah, I think I, I think in India it's, it's, it's to do with a lot of cultural baggage which we actually carry. So that's actually one of the very uh, you know primary reasons why the consumption per se is lower. Plus there are wines which basically are imported into India and very very expensive. So uh, pricing would be critical if I have to look at the Indian market mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of price point that I would like to pay in. Obviously, the Kama Sutra is ruled out if it is an enemy market. It's not going to work here. But wine as an aphrodisiac can work in the Indian market. Uh, so, you know, if I can uh, play a little bit of price and a little bit of uh, the aphrodisiac connotation, I think on a word of mouth, I think it, it would be a, a huge hit. What do, you, what do you think Advertising Council no, of India will do if you actually say it's an aphrodisiac? See, Advertising Council of India will <laughs> see somebody is going to go up there. They go to ask. We can do it. The grape is supposed to be part of aphrodisiac family. So, uh, if the main ingredient is an aphrodisiac, then a byproduct got to have something of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. So, we, I think we really have to look at this business idea. But we're very, very interesting sets of ideas. I'll just show you a very small uh, video in terms of like what this Australian player did. If you have read the book. Uh, you would have actually known what this Australian player has done, but I think it's a very interesting view in terms of like how do you uh, change the rules of the game. Uh, so I, I, it's just about an eight minute uh, or an eight and a half minute video. So I would just uh, play it for you right now. Hello tail. Hello tail. Hello tail bond. And above the line mark sent to One of the new world wine producers that entered the U.S. market in the late 1990s en masse was Australia. Much like America, Australia was not a wine-drinking country. Wine just couldn't compete in either of these beer and spirits dominated markets. Yet Australian winemakers wanted to have a go at the American market and almost overnight the number of wineries exploded from around 300 in 1980 to over 1,000 in 2000. Like the U.S. market, Australian wine production was highly consolidated. The big four, as they became known, Southcore, B.R.L. Hardy, Orlando Wyndham, and Behringer Blast controlled 85% of Australia's exports. Another 20 companies controlled about 10%, and the other 1,000 wineries the remaining 5%. This left very little room for small producers to export to the U.S., as they could not compete with the volume, distribution channels, or marketing budgets of the Big Four. Despite the dominance of the Big Four, in 2001, a small Australian winery called Casella Wines, with their importer, W.J. Deutsch & Sons, took a shot at the American market with the wine they called Yellowtail. It came in just two varieties, Chardonnay and Shiraz. It had a kangaroo on the label. It was priced at $7, and the industry nearly laughed them back to Australia. I always say that there's a gap between traditional drinkers that sort of don't drink wine and, and true wine drinkers that really um, a seasoned and conditioned to drinking wine and it's fairly hard for them to make that jump from one to the other. We've sort of closed that gap so it's quite easy to go from drinking soft drinks or, or um, pre-mixes or whatever it might be to drinking wine. What I love most about Yellow Tower is, is people have been telling me that 
they've made it an everyday pleasure rather than a special occasion indulgence. And I think that's what wine needs to be, rather than being something that you put in a wine rack and, and appreciate after three, four years, which is fine for premium wines. I'm, I'm not discrediting that at all. But I feel that wine needs to take the step towards the public and, and make it much more approachable. And I believe we're on the right track with Yellowtail. I think one of the things we, we decided not to do was to try to challenge uh, and compete head-on with the major players. I can buy a bottle of Yellowtail, take it home and consume it and enjoy it. Whereas in the past, I think a lot of the wine that was being put out into the marketplace was very complex, wonderful wine, wine that I enjoy drinking and many of my peers enjoy drinking, but it wasn't addressing the needs of 85% of consumers. The other concern I had was uh, in introducing the Shiraz and Chardonnay, the Chardonnay was introduced in the same bottle type as the Shiraz, which was a Bordeaux bottle. I think Yellowtail came along and we said right from the very beginning that, that we were unpretentious. You know, we had a kangaroo on the label, it was bright colours. Uh, you turn around and read the back label, the back label in no way talks about where the wine comes from or what the oak barrel maturation was. One of the ways we can uh, continue to help expand uh, overall consumption here in the U.S. Uh, is to uh, make it easier for the consumer. And one of the ways we can make it easier is to go after the other 88% of the population that doesn't own corkscrews. We go to the distributors and if we had a set to them, these five wines, uh, they're already under a lot of pressure to reduce the number of SKUs they have in their warehouse. In 2000, only one in four Americans are drinking wine, leaving per capita consumption at just 1.5 gallons per year. The French, in contrast, are drinking 16 gallons per year. In total, Americans are consuming 500 million gallons of wine each year compared to 6.5 billion gallons of beer. Same with the retailer. I'd go and knock on the door of a retailer and say to him, if I had have gone into him and said I've got five wines from Australia to sell, he would have put the barriers down straight away. We thought from a, from a cost-effective standpoint that to be plowing significant monies into heavy advertising before we were able to get the kind of distribution in America that we thought we were able to achieve uh, would be a waste of money. I like to think that our above the line advertising has, has actually cost us nothing because our above the line advertising is being done for us by our consumers. Bless them all. So we put together a wine style that we thought would not only be, um, I guess, pleasing to the general wine drinker, but also to the new wine drinker, so we could bring new people to the wine fold, if you like. We grew up with wine, and I remember as a child enjoying some wines and not enjoying others, and remembering my first taste of wine and how foreign that was to everything else that I tasted. And um, then later on, when I became winemaker, really wanting to produce something that wasn't so far and something that, that just came natural that you could enjoy like you did orange juice or apple juice um, or any of the flavoured soft drinks. To take the intimidation and exclusivity out of wine, Casella created the fun and adventure of Australia. This meant giving retail employees, many who had no traditional experience selling wine, outback clothing, including bushmen's hats and oilskin jackets to wear at work. This inspired retail employees to identify with and recommend Yellowtail.
think really the pride comes back to success in the family. Uh, we've succeeded in a business that we all know is oversupplied. We succeeded in a business that is capital intensive. We succeeded in a business that's dominated by some huge players with huge resources. Great. Uh, so this is uh, what this case is all about. So if, if you really notice, uh, there's something very interesting that they, these guys did. They just fundamentally tried to change the rule of the games. And that is how they actually started moving ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what they did was they tried to understand what are the uh, uh, basis on which consumers are actually making a decision and can they actually make this basis for decision uh, easier for the consumers. And that's what they've actually done. They have taken out the complexity out of wine and so on and so forth. And they've done exceptionally well uh, out, out in this business. Uh, so if you really look at it, uh, this leads us to a very important question in terms of say what strategy is all about and how do you really need to move ahead. And it actually says that you have to actually look at uh, uh, how do you actually look at it. And the question is going to be that you have to uh, find a new positioning and so on and so forth. But the process would be that you have to actually create new industry structures. You have to create new market spaces. You have to actually enter new market spaces. And once you enter those new market spaces, then the opportunity galores for you. Like it, it's absolutely a huge thing that could happen for you. Uh, again, uh, this was a very simple process of really looking at uh, the strategy canvas uh, in terms of saying, and okay, this is the basis for competition, and I'm going to change the basis for competition. And consumers would actually come over to us. Uh, in fact, uh, say, if you really look at the, the Blue Ocean Strategy book, uh, they are not the only set of uh, examples that you could look at. You could look at some huge examples within the Indian context as well. Uh, one, one prime example which I feel uh, that happened in India was, say, Oneda. Oneda and its erstwhile avatar, uh, they actually got that uh, spiky guy you know, who, who was some kind of a devil or whatever. Uh, but that was a very clear-cut uh, uh, positioning that they actually picked up. So they moved on to the devil. They actually uh, tried to say that, okay, our products are great and whatever, and uh, it's about envy and so on and so forth. So they suddenly changed the way people were really looking at the product. So th this is something which is very, very important that we need to do. Uh, we need to actually find newer spaces for ourselves. And we, how do we do it? And this is about the process. So I told you about uh, two things. One is a strategy canvas. The other one is the ERRC grid. Uh, if you really look at the book, you would actually get some huge level of insights on this ERRC grid. Well, what it says is like eliminate, raise, reduce, and uh, create. Uh, so what are the various parameters that could actually get eliminated, could be raised, could be reduced, or could be created? And that is what you're actually looking at. Uh, in fact, it, moving ahead on from uh, to the blue ocean strategy thing, uh, there were a couple of uh, things that I, I really wanted to talk to you about. Uh, before uh, uh, we close the course. Uh, in fact, one of the things is uh, an, a very interesting uh, thing called uh, network effects. Uh, in fact, if you, if you really look at uh, how companies succeed over a period of time, uh, they need to uh, do something which compels people to come back to them. So either it could be through branding or it could be, say, something like creating a virtuous cycle of consumption. And how do I actually create this virtuous cycle of consumption? That's the biggest paradigm that companies have started looking at today. Uh, this, uh, If you really look at one single or simple example, uh, in terms of, say, if, you, if you've read the Microsoft case, or if you all of you know about Microsoft, uh, if you really look at Microsoft, Microsoft is the most popular operating system in the world today. Uh, even though a lot of people would say it's not a great operating system, you have Apple, you have Linux, and so on and so forth, but still uh, Microsoft has actually been there. Windows has still been there. Why do, you, why do you think it actually happens? What could be the reason for this really uh, happening all across the board for the last number of years? What happened was that they created some kind of a effect or a network effect that happened. Uh, what you call as a virtuous cycle got created over a period of time. And what they did was that, okay, now if you want to actually, uh, uh, if you want to 
why how do you choose what operating system would you actually pick up you choose depending on the kind of softwares that are available for you so since windows software was easily available a consumer chose that okay he's actually going to buy windows it's easier for you and then the next thing was like okay since more consumers were actually using windows developers would actually start making more software for windows so then it became a virtuous cycle and just actually became a self feeding mechanism this has not really happened for other sets of softwares over a period of time it has not really happened for say apple it has not really happened for linux and so on and so forth now, in fact if you really look at it like this leads us to a very interesting debate in terms of like should piracy be allowed or not uh, because does piracy help you in creating some kind of a network effect uh, whether we like it or not i i fundamentally feel that piracy has been one of the greatest boons for microsoft and it is probably a strategic imperative for them that they allowed piracy uh, for a simple reason like because if if piracy was happening if people were stealing software and if they were actually picking up software from around the corner in say nehru place in delhi uh, it would mean that you could actually uh, you could run that software uh, you could enjoy that software and you will actually get used to it so once you actually get used to a certain software it becomes exceptionally difficult for you to really move out of that software so that's the same thing that actually was uh, happening uh, uh, in terms of say why why microsoft wanted piracy to happen you are actually making people get stuck to this and once they get stuck to it they will actually just be here and once after a certain point in time they will start paying for it and you would have actually noticed that people start paying for software over a period of time and of course they followed it up with other sets of strategy where they are trying to push uh, uh, what you call manufacturers and so on and so forth really looking at a non pirated software or licensed software uh, in fact uh, the talking about this virtuous cycle and so on and so forth uh, what has happened is like linux has not really become very popular uh, why for a simple reason that virtuous cycle never got created apple has not become popular because they, the software the cycle was not created so if you really look at businesses then uh, what is it that we need to understand here Uh, we need to understand that businesses will need to create this virtuous cycle of consumption in fact this leads to a very important issue of say lifetime value of customer that we have discussed in the past and this also leads us to about the lifetime engagement with the product that the consumer has uh, in fact one company which is not a technology company in terms of say um, being on the internet or whatever uh, but it actually makes a technology product and they've created a virtuous cycle of consumption and that's about uh, hp uh, what hp does is something very interesting in terms of they are trying to sell you a, a printer today for about say 2200 rupees uh, but they know that if, i'm sure they lose money on the 2200 rupees printer but they are going to make money after they are, you are actually going to uh, take the consumables that is your cartridges or uh, whatever and that is where hp starts making money and they've created a virtuous cycle the, these products are so uh, they are not standardized products they are they are not open source products that are actually existing so that you you cannot actually pick up the cartridge from anybody else and then use it you could probably refill it for a number of times one or two times but you still have to go back to original cartridges somewhere so they've created a very interesting cycle wherein you are compelled to consume that basic thing uh, so th- this has actually happened across the board for printers in fact if you really look at a company like say uh filter companies they are also doing the same thing wherein you are actually going to get a particular set of candles that can actually go into it say eureka phobes does it or when you talk about kent purifiers they actually do it they have some very uh, what do you call proprietary kind of candles that they would have actually built and they would have actually asked to use it uh another example that you can actually look at uh, is how nestle is trying to create network effects or a cycle of consumption uh, with uh, uh, coffee Uh, in fact they've started uh, there are vending machines uh, that that are actually coming out right now uh, which would use a certain kind of a sachet uh, out of which coffee would come so you have that sachet which gets fitted into a machine but it has a particular design and whatever and then the machine actually uses it in a certain way so it becomes very difficult for you to actually go uh, out and pick up a sachet from somebody else and make it operate in your machine so you're trying to create a cycle here uh, in fact uh, a lot of times you you use anti competitive processes or uh, situations or strategies when you want to create this kind of a cycle in fact very interestingly like uh, we did talk about the issue of number portability it could actually get related to this as well uh, if you actually just do a leap of imagination and start thinking about it so so if you really look at it like 
this is one thing that we need to actually look at and that is how network effects could actually get created, how consumption cycles should actually be done and so on and so forth. So this is a huge strategy thing that companies are actually looking at. Uh, in fact, uh, PepsiCo, uh, how, how would PepsiCo do it? PepsiCo would actually take, in fact, if you remember the Medici thing that we were really talking about, uh, PepsiCo would actually create some kind of an association between chips and Tazos. And kids are actually just wanting to buy those Tazos, they want to get into that collection cycle, but they are actually buying uh, chips for it, or what do you call as lace for it. So uh, they're, they're just trying to create some kind of an association here, and then they are just getting into a consumption cycle. So uh, this is one thing that we, I really wanted to talk about. Uh, but one last thing that I really feel that we should, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, look at, and that is about thinking about strategy uh, in a little more uh, open way. A lot, a lot of times, and going beyond the theoretical constructs that are being presented. Um, a very simple uh, question from you. Airtel, the typical idea uh, of outsourcing is that you should outsource your core, uh, you should outsource your non-core activities. And uh, if, if you really look at it, uh, should I really outsource my non-core uh, core activities or not? The traditional view of thought would say that you should not outsource your uh, core activities. It's actually going to be a problematic thing because this is where you actually are going to, this is proprietary knowledge. You don't want anybody to actually come and mess you up and so on and so forth. And that was the school of thought till about the last five years. Uh, but one company came onto the scene and then fundamentally altered the way we actually start looking at uh, the whole idea of outsourcing. In fact, if you really talk about Airtel, this is uh, where we started in terms of, say, how Airtel started looking at outsourcing. Airtel said, okay, uh, uh, we want to grow and uh, we do not have cash and uh, we want to actually uh, uh, give the burden of growth to a few more people outside and uh, what can we actually outsource? Uh, and at that point in time, they said, okay, we should uh, look at outsourcing network. And network was taken as the most important part in the telecom industry. Uh, in this case, uh, they said, okay, uh, is it that network is giving me power within the industry? This is where the whole idea of industry structure should actually come in. Who is going to give you power within the industry? What is it? What kind of strategy or what kind of proprietary knowledge or whatever? is going to give you that strength within the industry, which is going to give you that strangle hold within the industry. So is it that uh, towers or is it something else? In that case, it was very clear, it was imperative that it is not towers which is actually going to give you the strength within the industry. It's the spectrum which gives you strength within the industry. And since spectrum is the uh, reason for your existence and reason for your power within the industry, you could actually outsource the rest of the things. And that is what they've actually done. They've outsourced nearly everything that they actually do. So their billing is outsourced, uh, their uh, customer service is outsourced, their networking is outsourced, and it actually helped them in a multiple sets of ways. And it actually helped, since they were outsourcing towers, they actually were able to focus on something else in terms of a growing market. And uh, they did not really have to look at investments as well, because tower investments in tower was something which was very huge. And if you really look at it, this has actually given rise to a very interesting industry itself. Uh, for a simple reason, now you're actually talking about shared infrastructure. So that is, there are shared infrastructure providers now. So people who are uh, talking about uh, uh, providing network capabilities and whatever. And now you're actually going to have virtual mobile operators. And uh, one, one um, uh, what do you call, a company which has actually already done this uh, is Virgin Mobile, which is a virtual mobile operator. And now they're actually, so they do not have uh, anything. So they become a virtual mobile operator and now that's something very, very powerful that has happened. So newer sets of structures are going to emerge over a period of time at the way companies start looking at uh, options and opportunities and strategizing. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to actually look at strategy from newer dimensions all the time. We need to actually look at businesses with newer uh, sets of lenses because things are going to change. Things are going to change around us. And I think we need to actually have a perspective which is a little more ahead. Companies which are able to define what is going to happen in the next five years. Are the companies which are going to be successful? I, it is not about the past. Strategy is not embedded in the past. Strategy is about the future. It is embedded in the future. So we need to actually create a pathway for the future that I actually want to achieve. And that is what we really have to do in this process. Sure, so the, these are a couple of uh, things that I really wanted to talk to you about. 
Uh, but then uh, if you really look at the course outline, we have covered uh, most of the ground that we wanted to actually cover. And uh, we have done all the cases. In fact, a uh, couple of cases that we have not done, but I feel that it's it's not really going to, uh, you're not really going to lose a lot of things here. Uh, sure. Uh, so these are a few learnings. Let's let's break for about say five minutes. I'll just come back and we'll just have a small round of feedback, and then just try to move towards toward, towards the closure of the program. Uh, we'll just try to summarize what we have learned and uh, so on and so forth. Sure. So five minute break. We uh, let's let's keep it for ten minutes. We'll start at seven twenty five. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, welcome back. Uh, so uh, let, let's move ahead and let, let's uh, gather some experiences uh, from people and so on and so forth. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, and if you could just give me some kind of a recap in terms of uh, what you learned in the course and uh, uh, would you like to uh, comment on something special that happened in the course, what you didn't like, what you liked and so on and so forth. So a small set of feedback. Uh, so I would actually go one on one uh, with all of you, and uh, then I'll make some closing uh, uh, remarks. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Siddharth uh, from Lucknow. Hi, Siddharth. So that could you unmute your mic? Ask him to call the technical coordinator over there. Could you call the technical coordinator? I'll come back to you, Siddharth. So, uh, till the time uh, this issue is not resolved, uh, let's go to uh, Purna. Yes, Purna. Uh, we have learned a lot of things. Uh, yes, Purna, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, throughout the course, through the course, uh, how the strategy of a company should be. Uh, what are the problems uh, that we are facing uh, in the market and uh, how to resolve the uh, problems, how how to enter the new markets, how to capture them, mm -hmm. uh, blue ocean, red ocean series. Okay. And uh, even the tools, uh, we have learned some of the management uh, tools. Uh, Mark Strat and uh, I've read uh, something about Strategy Canvas tool, uh, and uh, I learned a lot of things uh, over the time, uh, and very good. Uh, great to be part of this program. Uh, great. Can you suggest uh, some more uh, books and uh, any other websites? Uh, certainly, I I think. Uh, uh, as for websites, I would suggest that you should start uh, reading a couple of blogs that happen, like at least read the HPSP blog, Harvard Business School Publishing blogs that they do. Uh, they have some very good, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, writings and so on and so forth that go there. And if you have limited time, then you should read one journal, uh, that is the Harvard Business Review, which is which I feel is one of the best that is actually written in the world. Uh, so you should actually look at reading that. Uh, in terms of a list of the books, I would send you some lists. Uh, uh, on email, uh, so that you could just uh, start reading them. Uh, and, and any suggestions, Purna, in terms of like how we should improve this course and uh, what we should do? Uh, uh, if we would have done uh, some more uh, exercises, uh, it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we want some more exercises in this. Perfect. Uh, so let's see, like how how do we do that? Like that. That's a very. Uh, uh, that's a very huge task, actually. Uh, 
I'm not saying that it's not doable, but then it's, it actually gets a little difficult. But then great, great uh, uh, having you in the course. So I hope it was uh, good for you. Yeah. And you, Thank you, you very much. Oh, I, oh, you're welcome. I hope you did not waste your uh, money in this and you invested your time and it was good for you. And there was a learning experience out here. Great. Uh, great, Poona. So uh, yeah. uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, let, let's uh, talk to Siddharth from Lucknow. I hope his uh, technological issues have got resolved uh, by now. Yes, Siddharth. Yes. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I agree. I, I okay. Uh, I agree. I was on, not on the on my desk when you probably asked us to. So I don't exactly know what is the scope of what we are supposed to say. Oh, okay. Uh, so that just just uh, about like what, what do you think was the learning from the course for you? And uh, how do you think we we should improve this yeah. course over a period of time? And do you think uh, you you invested your time well in the course? That these are a few questions. And if you have if you want to make some other special remarks, or you would like to say anything else, then it's okay. Uh, hey, I'll be very brief. I, I love the course and uh, the, a huge learning, and especially uh, thinking from a strategic point of view. Uh, point of view is kind of, has to kind of become second nature for me because of the. <laughs> All, all the, all the uh, things that have gone through, and especially the workshop, two day workshop, and and uh, this is something that is the new paradigm that we have gained, that I've gained especially. Okay. So looking at everything from a strategic point of view is something that I've gained. And uh, to uh, say uh, something that could be improved for this program, I would have really loved it had these sessions been in the morning, maybe. Okay. It was just just one part. Okay, in terms of the scheduling part. Maybe parts. maybe. Uh, maybe Scheduling part. Maybe a Sunday morning thing. I don't know. It's just a personal choice. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Like, That's I hope we are able to do some better scheduling the next time, and uh, we are able to get something out of it. And any any way that you would. Right. Uh, so this is the improvement uh, perspective from your side. Right. right. Great, great, Siddharth. Uh, great. The platform is great. The platform is great. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Siddharth, for this. Oh, we we have Siddharth from Gurugram today as well. Uh, he is. Uh, yes, Siddharth, uh, you're on air. Would you like to say something, Siddharth? Wow. We don't have him on air, <laughs> so he just suddenly lost. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> okay, Anupama. Anything you would like to say? Am I audible? Absolutely, Anupama. Uh, this course was like, uh, I mean, boot up camp for me because uh, probably I was not looking into strategy at all as a people. I knew the word called strategy. And now, I mean, it has laid some seeds of where I could start getting into more topics, right? Because it is really put in that interesting to me that I need to learn more, understand more, get into more books related to strategy. That is what has happened during the course of this program. And another thing which I said was these case studies that we were trying to do two case studies in, our, in one session, which did not really materialize for us. So probably went too tight. So probably when you do it next time, I mean, somehow, because it's only 14 of us, we couldn't really close it down. So if you have a bigger set of crowd, I'm sure it will be all the more tough with too many kind of queries, questions coming in. So with just 14, on, I mean, probably 10 to 11 being present on one particular day, we still would not be in a position to finish it off. So the uh, cases were, yes, lots of distributive cases of different areas, basically focusing on different areas. But I think the one case study and very little sub more assignment, that's it. For one day would be three hours would be done. That's uh, how I've been seeing in the last sessions. Uh, I agree with you, Anupama. I That's think uh, from next time onwards, like when we actually do this course, I would uh, primarily do just one case in a uh, day, so that we are able to take our discussions forward and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is what I, I think I will follow this uh, suggestion of yours, and we would actually implement it from uh, uh, the next time onwards itself. And probably do little more exercises and uh, such set of things uh, when we are in the session here. Uh, of course, uh, when we actually started the course, my expectation was that since we are just 14, we might actually be able to do 
uh, or we we, are, we were not really yeah, looking okay. at having more than 20 participants. So I was thinking that I will be able to do, say, about uh, two cases. But I, I felt that the discussion levels were something which was very interesting. So even with 20 people, I think just about one case in three hours would have actually made sense. So we will actually follow this from next time uh, uh, onwards. Uh, anything else that you would like to say, Anupama? So, but it's very nice to note that you are actually okay. looking at reading a lot on strategy and things. So, uh, at least I've been able yeah, to convince I've somebody. Been reading. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I've been reading other books for sure, and uh, I've been quite a, I'm a reader basically. But somehow I would not pick up a book on strategy. I mean, which would be related with strategy because I thought probably it's a very difficult mind game. But somehow now I feel that yes, I am in a position to. Go ahead and even pick up those books. Great. That's thank, thank, thanks, 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 Anup. Sure. So nice, nice to hear this. Thank you, uh, Anup. Uh, anything that you would like to say in terms of your learnings and uh, how do you think that we should improve this course and uh, things? This was a great uh, exposure to a lot of different concepts and that gives us the confidence that we can definitely utilize those in our day-to-day -day work situations by uh, probably researching more on those concepts and applying them on the typical situations that we face. So that's been primarily a great learning. The other positive things for me that I was looking for that I got in this course was along with the conceptual knowledge and many things, um, opportunity to meet with people from different diverse backgrounds get different views and understand how people from different backgrounds think and uh, how ideation can happen. And primarily the highlight of the course was the two-day workshop where I got to meet all the wonderful colleagues and of course you uh, had a great experience there. A uh, couple of areas if I were to be critical at all was one in terms of technology there have been a couple of minor issues which uh, not so much for uh, uh, the from a course content perspective or delivery perspective but from a technology perspective otherwise uh, I think it was a great uh, great experience. So. Great. So anu Anup, I, I would just like to ask you one thing. Do you, do you think we should extend, extend the number of days that we have for uh, the uh, campus visit, say increase it from two days to three days and do you think that would actually help and that would be more exciting for our future participants? I personally am of the opinion that a lot more learning could have happened if we had a slightly extended uh, okay. uh, personal interface session and uh, well structured session. So that's my view. Okay, no, I probably hold a similar view from next time onwards. I was thinking that we should do a three day session rather than just doing a two day session because I think over three days you could actually do or give so much more and you could have some more very interesting speakers who could actually be locally residing and who who are not very scary, scared of coming on the platform because I, I found a lot of people who were a little scared of coming on the platform. So we could actually get those set of people in the real life uh, situation. Uh, uh, great, uh, Anup. Uh, yes, Meena. Meena. Hello. Yes, Meena. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, um, I basically joined this uh, course after looking at the content. I was very excited about the, the different case studies that uh, we were doing and the, the kind of concepts. See, uh, uh, basically I joined this course because of the duration and the content and also it, to bridge some of the gaps in my experience and skill sets. I have been quite tactical and operational in my experience, so so this is to to you know to, um, to to acquire that kind of thinking and the 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 uh, and to have that kind of thought processes which is strategic, applying the concepts, looking at the experiences by different um, companies adopted by different companies via different case studies. So that has been very good, and uh, the also we have covered. Um, a lot of uh, areas like the five forces analysis and the diamond analysis, the value chain, and those are the very good. And also, the, the I also like the, uh, the the number of people, 14 or 15 people from different industry. The, the perspectives are different, so you can get uh, what others are thinking, and uh, it's a, it's a good platform. In the I mean, uh, the, the interactiveness is also very good. Uh, one suggestion would be like. Uh, uh, see, we could not do justice to all the case studies, although we, I, we would have loved to discuss all the things. And as, as Anupama said, Ki, why not have only one case study per class instead of two? So one thing would have been making, a, instead of once a week, maybe why can't we have 
two days a week <laughs> where we can do all the case study that is one suggestion <laughs> i mean if if uh, if it is uh, okay for all the people i mean that would have been good and uh, another thing is drawing from indian case studies that would be that would have been it's predominantly american and companies and uh, that okay. is another area that that would be good uh, we of course we did indian flour mills but uh, in addition to that some other uh, okay uh, very very quick uh, thing here in fact uh, next time onwards uh, we are going to have six indian cases in fact i've just released five new cases of mine on the harvard business school platform so we're going to have five more cases uh, that would actually be indian cases that have been written by me on various sets of industries and things so they are actually going to get uh, on the platform and we would actually start doing those in the program so we would actually have a robust mix of indian cases and non indian uh cases that would actually happen in terms of the other suggestion of uh, doing just one case in the class i probably go with that suggestion i think that is what we would do because uh, the platform creates some very interesting sets of uh, interactions and so on and so forth so i agree with you on that uh, meena uh, uh great so we we would actually uh, keep these suggestions in mind and uh, in terms of say two sessions a week i'm not too sure whether that would be possible in terms of say uh, making it happen uh, because from the schedule scheduling point of view but i think we would uh, probably either increase the number of sessions or whatever we could actually look at either one of them and uh, uh, we should do this uh, so th thanks a lot for your suggestions meena on this uh, i'll of course meet you uh, offline as well once we finish the course so that that yeah. how it will be uh visu uh Hi Visu. Am I audible? Absolutely Visu. Hi. Hi. Okay. A uh, lot of knowledge sharing happened during this course and um, I felt uh, if we would have done the contact session in the middle of the course rather than end of the course because um, after that session only like we were able to um, analyze and the thinking in the strategy think in perspective so that is the one improvement area i am seeing it uh, apart from that like it was a learning for uh, throughout the course and uh, and from the diversified uh, people and uh, even it's not only the uh, specific domain people came in this one and uh, they participated so even sometimes like uh, the marketing uh, those areas like we able to learn from the people who are currently working in the product companies so it was a really good learning for thank you vishu uh, in terms of your uh, uh, campus visit program i, I think uh, we would start uh, looking at it in fact i've already been talking to nit that can we do two campus visits uh, rather than just doing one campus visit so like do certain set of work uh, at one time and probably just have people for two days and probably towards the end of the program or whatever we're just really looking at it from a pedagogy view point we are really considering uh, or looking at a lot of options probably have three day thing or a four day interaction or split the four day interaction into two days so this is what i I've, i've been talking to them so let's see how it actually goes and how we are able to build it up uh, but i i think your suggestions are uh, fair, very very valid in terms of like can we do it in the middle of the course because that would actually just build the momentum uh, for the analysis and things uh, yes i i'll keep these suggestions in mind uh, for sure so th thanks a lot for this uh last two guys so patabi raman yeah hello yes yes yeah yeah okay uh, coming from the uh, point of relevance uh, to the current profile i think i'm looking more i was always looking from the point of uh, uh, relevance of this subject per se uh, to be put in actual uh, reality for the current profile which i hold i think it is making quite a lot of sense it is just that uh, uh, it has to be put into action more than ever before because the time has changed the profile of uh, an individual person like the change of the the year or so so uh, i think this course has actually given me uh, a certain amount of uh, impetus to move forward in the current uh, job profile i think that is uh, very key and that to summarize that the, um, the context of or the, the, the various topics which have been covered in the uh, course having pretty relevant um, 
I think I will uh, stop with that. Yes, there are, uh, that is more so from the point of context. Uh, kind of feedback in terms of uh, the Indian perspective, uh, not many of us here have been working you know, for uh, US kind of an environment. So I think if we could uh, get some more relevance in terms of the Indian uh, uh, case studies, it would have uh, you know, the absorption of the basic uh, strategy uh, would have been you know, Much better. far better accepted and the participation could have been far, far higher. I think that is something uh, why the is why other peers in the group have not been speaking per se. Uh, that is something which I put to debate. Yeah, uh, one more interesting thing which comes into mind is the point, uh, this course is actually really emphasized the basic fundamental point that knowledge is power and to get more knowledge I think one needs to be reading quality. I think uh, that has come out very, very vividly whether it is totally enough or be it uh, pairing with a group who is uh, knowledgeable per se and has got that insight into uh, greater knowledge, I think, uh, and 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 if you're, I'm sure you would be open to receive uh, uh, emails and phone calls from most of us. I guess I hope I hope you wouldn't uh, shun them out into uh, something. Uh, I, I'm only hoping for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like to say something here. Uh, in fact, Murli, this is so. It, it feels so nice to hear that at least there is some reading habit that is actually going to be be built up over a period of time, or you would ha you have actually been able to get there. So it's absolutely, uh, I feel great about it. As a faculty, I feel that if I'm able to give this to you in the last, say, three months, uh, it's probably an achievement for me. So I feel very happy about it. Uh, in terms of, uh, say, being in touch with you folks, I think uh, uh, we have built a great association during this program, and I would love to be in touch with all of you. Uh, in fact, as I had announced earlier also, all of you, for me, are going to be the first set of alumni for the Institute for Competitiveness as well. So as promised, you get certificates of participation from institutes for competitiveness as well for this program. And I think, uh, so you, you become a very important part of growth for something that I'm planning to do and I'm trying to do. Uh, so uh, we should all be in touch and I think we should uh, meet off and on. In fact, I was actually thinking of uh, suggesting to NIT that since this, once this course gains momentum and if we have actually gone through some set of things, we should have one uh, probably Every one year, uh, we should have a three-hour session which is going to be free for alumni of this course that they, we could just recapture what we have done and probably newer concepts that are there and we could just have some kind of a, a association building up. So this is what we, I would certainly do. Uh, anything else that you would uh, like yeah. to say? Yeah, I, I have okay. three more points. Uh, okay. yeah, one of them is, uh, two of them have been covered, which is one case per class ideal, although not suggested, but it's ideal for those important concepts alone from the it, it is uh, like about 40, 50 percent of the concept are pretty critical and I think that is where we could do only one case. Otherwise, we could have managed our time better by uh, two cases. So that's fine. So where we have had uh, five months, we could actually roll up to six months and close it off. Uh, yeah, in, in, and in terms of the number of contact, contact days that are uh, uh, daily session, I think it could have gone up to three or possibly even four. I think four would have been ideal because uh, I think that's how I felt. Yes, one key important factor, I don't know how much of it you would buy and you would be able to manage that for all of us out here. Uh, we are talking about an alumni and the certification from MDI and things like that. Uh, we are not talking about being uh, the part of the association uh, of the MDI alumni. Can this certification be uh, grouped in such a way that we are part of the MDI alumni? We are part of it. I don't know whether this course is currently addressing that. Uh, Six months so the four months so is not addressing that, but it would be great if we are part of the enemy. It makes a lot of sense. So, Ravi Raman, like, in yes. fact, uh, you are certainly going to get a certification from MDI. There is no doubt about it. We would be sending you the certificates in the next two, two, three weeks. Uh, but in terms of, say, alumni, uh, at MDI, we've actually had a very simple norm of uh, categorizing somebody as alumni. Anybody who does uh, a program which is greater than 12 months at MDI is going to be categorized as alumni. Uh, we would actually, we are actively con actively considering something called as the MDP, under MDP alumni. So uh, once that actually happens, then we would uh, certainly consider this group to be part of the MDP alumni. Uh, so that is what we would do uh, over a period of time. Great, but uh, having said that, I think uh, you, you, we are addressing a group of 14 or 15 people who have uh, put in a certain amount of uh, work in, anywhere starting from 2 to 15. So I think that should uh, give us some leverage of being part of the I am not pushing too hard, but 
no i don't know like whether it will ha- ever happen or not but I, let let me just see if we are able to do something about it i would go to give you the good news if it is not happening then you don't have to shoot me right you don't have to assassinate me for this <laughs> so that is how it will be sure so uh, uh, thanks for this uh, patabi raman i i'll keep this in mind and i i'll i'll try if we are able to do something about this uh, sure so uh, it it would be certainly a delight to actually do uh, uh, something of this sort uh, but uh, let's see how mdi reacts and what it is in fact i must share this with you uh, that uh, i am an alumni of mdi i'm sure all of you know about it and i've actually been one of the most vociferous critics of not letting mdp participants be alumni of mdi so uh, <laughs> in fact as an alumni i've actually been fighting that battle to the nail and i've not let it happen in the last 10 years at least so now suddenly <laughs> you're asking me to change my <laughs> whole <laughs> tactic so then let me see how it could actually be done but then very candid set of uh, remark here in terms of like what i've actually believed in and what i've actually told at mdi and how he fought it in fact i was the alum- i've been the alumni chairman for number of years and i have always made it a point that this, this should not happen uh, but then yes actively looking at uh, you guys to be mdp alumni mdp mdi mdp alumni yes uh, that's something which should, we should do yeah one uh, one one last point i think i'm pushing too many things that uh, Uh, if there is no scope, uh, or rather you would create a scope, that is something which I am looking at. But having said that, if uh, we need to meet up again, probably put a comma to this session. Uh, of course, we are going to close this, but uh, open up a new chapter which could uh, actually uh, run for about uh, four weeks or six weeks, and then make it a part of an M- 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 MDP, and uh, people would be delighted to be part of the event. Uh, could you just be a little? Uh I couldn't really understand this point, uh, Pratapi Raman. Could you just repeat it? What are you saying? We meet every four to six weeks, or what are you saying? No, we we extend the program. We although we close it today formally. Just just a second, just a second. Uh, suddenly the voice just went down. Yeah. Yes, Pratapi Raman. Okay. Although we although we although we are closing this program today formally, mm-hmm. um, there could be an association by uh, putting a comma and say that we meet up. for a later time probably after 2 months or 3 months and uh, with a probably a nominal cost or no cost uh, for a period of 3 4 5 weeks and uh, then that group becomes a part of a larger gang of uh, the mdp alumni means if that is what is the crux of 12 months program to uh, <laughs> i'm just i'm just trying to explore that that is all <laughs> no comments trying to eliminate something and create something <laughs> <laughs> i like that one that is fair fair bit of creativity around here <laughs> great with abhi raman uh, so like let, let, let's see if we are able to do something about it like i i'll keep you in the loop on this sure so that is how it is great uh, thank uh, yeah thank I'm thank i'm i'm over i'm over and out that's it <laughs> thank you thank you uh, yes uh, murli Uh, i think it was a uh, uh, for me i think uh, one big thing for me is having uh, you know had an opportunity to interact with uh, so many people uh, sitting from chennai and to understand you know how people view things very differently in most of the cases where i had a particular way of looking at it but i think each and everybody had their own ways of looking at things which was pretty interesting for me Uh, the second thing is i think the mark set was the uh, crown of the entire thing uh, but i would have uh, loved if there was any cash rewards at uh, if it was actually for a three day program it would have been uh, a lot more fun <laughs> sure uh, i i agree with uh, you on that molly yes uh, the other point is i i thought the focus on theory was a little less okay. or uh, rather weak i think probably uh, taking from what uh, anupama or uh, meena or murli had said probably if we do one case and probably devote about half an hour 45 minute on a theory which probably will have a link to the case uh, the following week um, i think uh, see what i found is uh, the level of uh, participation uh, was quite different from individual to individual yeah uh, i don't know that i can be as candid as this but the comprehension were also at very different levels 
because I think it's a diverse group uh, with varied exposure to management and senior management level. So some kind of uh, bit of hand holding at least for the first three cases could have set the ball rolling. So we could have had much more interesting analysis uh, in the later cases that we had. So I, frankly speaking, I felt a little short of uh, great intellect being you know uh, uh, around the case discussions. Uh, in uh, fact, uh, a lot of pick and run from the sure. from the you know case that you just read it, and not really dwelling into the depth of the issues and things like that. So that was one uh, negative probably I thought, which uh, you know we need to look at uh, ways to handle that. Uh, Murli, in fact, uh, uh, very interestingly, yeah. uh, next next time onwards, whenever I do the course for the first session that we do before we start the course, we'll actually have how to analyze a case course. So our, our, we would actually have a three hour session on how to analyze a case. And I think that's a very critical thing that we need to do. And I actually accept what you're saying uh, that because uh, I think we need to all go to a level playing field and we need to be on the same platform so that we are able to take right. the discussions higher together. So we, we would do that. And I, I think uh, that's uh, not a problem in terms of say, the candidates or whatever, it's just because the pedagogy is very new. We are probably not used to yeah, this absolutely. pedagogy. That's right. Yeah, we are not used to this yeah. pedagogy. So right. it just so takes I'm time. Not saying, yeah. yeah, I'm not. Yeah, so it just yeah. takes time to sink in. So uh, that is where it is. So we would actually have a session of this sorts for sure. In terms of the theoretical perspective, uh, I think from uh, next time onwards, what we are going to do is we are going to have a two hour discussion on a case or a two and a half hour discussion and followed by a theoretical uh, session very, very clearly. Uh, so that is what we would actually do uh, the next time onwards so that we get into a little more. Uh, what do you call fixed, uh, a more structured way of really doing it. So we would actually get into that. That's right. Uh, so we would do that. I, I think uh, it's again a question of experimenting on the platform, how things go and how much time it takes. So it was the first time for us as well. Uh, so I'm sure like next time onwards when we do the course, we would have a huge levels of improvements and we would be able to move ahead on that. Anything, you were also wanting to say something else. Yeah, the other thing that I want to say is I think, uh, see the, um, uh, project work or the assignment, I think it probably uh, didn't carry it, take it forward properly. I think it's probably our mistake and uh, probably you are running out of time. But I thought probably a two week addition to this course in terms of purely on a, at least a short assignment or a project, which you yourself could have actually given it as a group or an individual. And we could have had an assessment on that, uh, you know, which would yes. have really helped this. I agree with uh, you on that. In fact, more because I uh, that is what we have been looking I at. Should think I yeah. In fact, like on this it's itself. Short. Sorry, you go ahead and then I'll say something. Okay, sorry. So I'm feeling actually short. Yeah, we we've done the six, uh, you know, nine weeks mark stand and things like. That. But even if I sit to write on something, for instance, on my own project, I don't know whether you've got time to go through it. But if I actually sit down and try and you know rewrite that entire thing. And I'm not going in the pace that I would love to. I know it, but uh, probably you know some kind of practice. If we could have had it here, it would have really helped a little more. Uh, you know, for people like us, uh, you know, where we are actually going to implement uh, these kind of things. Uh, so that's one other point. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I I think what you're saying is uh, probably very very. Uh uh, true, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, the uh, project and whatever, and we should actually start uh, more structured approach to doing the project or whatever. In fact, this is where we were really thinking: should we have two rounds of uh, campus visits? Would that be feasible or not? Because in the first round of campus visit, we could say that okay, now let's discuss the project and everything, and let, let's start the ball rolling. Let's probably make the groups or whatever, do the program let these people coordinate on the platform or whatever way they want to do it. And then they come back uh, during the second cohort of say campus visit and then we could actually do something there uh, in terms of their presentations and so on and so forth or probably have an examination on this. Uh, so we are considering these uh, things very, very actively. Uh, uh, but I think Murli, like, uh, it's again a learning experience for us uh, on this platform. I think uh, yeah, it's a platform which is uh, uh, from a faculty point of view, I could be very candid uh, uh, here. Uh, what, what happens is it's, it's a little uh, uh, intimate. I'll not say intimidating, but it's just a little. Uh, it just puts you in some kind of a back foot somewhere. Uh, 
for a simple reason that uh, you you're not there in front of me uh, so pushing you or asking you to do a few things gets a little difficult somewhere and you that that whole time or full time connectivity just misses out somewhere so we need to find some better ways of really getting connected and probably that connectivity has to happen beyond email i think can we use some technology which makes us get connected more and more interactive somewhere or whatever uh, so that is what i was just thinking can we do this so like if you have any suggestions on that it, it would just be great so that we are able to build it into the future batches if you ask me i think one uh, simple way that you can do it you can bring in a competitive spirit among the participants maybe you could give some assignments to two three guys and tell them you got a present for the next week you know then a lot of interaction flows in and at least somebody yep. sits and goes through it you know there is some kind of involvement uh, just gets into it so probably that could be one of the way in kind of getting that link going a little stronger uh, just a thought no i i to say i have a couple of points Yeah, sure. Go. So you you have something else to I say? I think I bought this blue ocean strategy on the twenty second of November two thousand eight. Okay. I finally read it early now. <laughs> okay, at least you read it. Yeah, that that's the, the bright side of the story. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one one uh, two people are going to be extremely happy with the course getting over. Going to be my daughters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I I hope you don't show her my pictures and say that okay you sleep or else I'll go into this guy's class. <laughs> <laughs> I will really show all your pictures. <laughs> they are quite interested with your uh, you know your rig. <laughs> oh okay so they they kind of find it very <laughs> weird. Okay. They are asking me to wear one. <laughs> Come again? We oh they're asking you to they're wear one. Me to wear one. <laughs> you should do that actually. It's it's a it's a hugely good thing to do. <laughs> But then again like I feel that it's India's cultural heritage and we should actually carry it forward and why should we actually carry a complex? Uh, if we are Indians then yeah, this yeah, is this true. is part of our Indian uh, thing somewhere. So I just thought I I must do it. Uh, so this is how it is. But very quickly just last couple of uh, points here I uh, from my side. Uh, I think it was such a delight to really talk to all of you uh, in fact for me uh, it was the first time when i was actually doing something of this sort and uh, uh, to begin with uh, i was not too sure how it how it would actually go and how we would be able to carry it forward uh, would we be in a position to really keep it exciting enough uh, on this platform uh, but i must share it uh, with you i think the class or the complete group was so so good in terms of say like the interaction and everything uh and then i we were able to build some very interesting discussions and we were able to learn a lot of things together uh in fact uh, i must be candid that i learned a lot of things from uh, each one of you in certain ways uh in terms of like uh, how you look at things uh, how you actually uh, you you did challenge me at a number of times of course i would as a faculty i should never show it in my face that i'm getting challenged somewhere in uh, the way you are thinking or whatever Uh, but i think it was a good challenge uh, for me as well so it was a great learning experience for me i think uh, it's just been a delight to know you and uh, i would just like to say that uh, we should all uh, be in touch and uh, whenever you are actually traveling to say uh, delhi or whatever let, let's catch up uh, and then uh, in case if i am traveling to any one one of the locations say either it is bombay or it's probably chennai or whatever uh, then we would uh, certainly uh, come uh, i should come over and meet In fact, Murli, I am actually going to ask you a favor online. Next time when I am in Chennai, you have to book me my sure. tickets for Tirupati, uh, so uh, on that bus. Done, 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 done. So I will actually take that done. favor from you, and uh, because that's what uh, oh, sure, I would sure, love sure. to do. Uh, It will be a pleasure. The, uh, I'll, I'll pleasure. be in touch with you on that. But then, uh, uh, so let all of you have a great time ahead and uh, do well. And in fact, uh, New Year is just around the corner, uh, so I am sure you're going to all going to have a great New Year, and you're going to have great life ahead of you and a great careers ahead of you. Uh, let's be in touch and uh, be well i'll create a network uh, on my uh, institute for competitiveness thing so we'll all create an alumni network for this course uh, on linkedin or something so let's uh, let us all be members of that and let's let's keep in touch and keep up building up a good association in a, somewhere so this this is how where i'll uh, call it off and uh, all of you take care of uh, yourself thank you thank you and goodbye all of you bye bye Thank you.